the problem with the ADHD. You amygdala is, is alive, but the executive center shut down. It's not myelinated. And so you got a running wild animal around the house. But once you get them engaged in something inspiring, the amygdala calms down and you start having less impulse and instinct. Today's topic is on attention deficit hyperactivity, quote, disorder, because I'm going to put that in quotation marks, because it uh, may not be a disorder in my perspective. It may have a slightly different view of it. Now, this is defined that way primarily because that the individual, usually children and very commonly boys, um, have a wandering, distracted inattentiveness to things that teachers or parents are wanting them to do. They are running around highly hyperactive and distracted. They are also restless and hyperactive in the sense sometimes I've seen these children, uh, particularly boys, running back and forth, just literally running across the room and um, running around in circles and doing repetitive actions. And um, we may have all had little bits and pieces of this type of behavior. And the last one is an immediate gratifying impulsivity. So you have a very qu quick, short span of attention and you want a quick answer, a quick response, a quick gratification, and you're impulsive. Now, that's tr a triad. Again, wandering, distracted in attention, restless hyperactivity, and immediate gratifying impulsivity. That's the description of this condition. I put that in parentheses because I'm, I'm not convinced that it's a condition, even though that's what the medical model typically has. I'm more convinced that it's a feedback to the child and to the family of what's really important to the child. Because the child who that has this, and sometimes young adults and sometimes adults, I know people in their 50s and 60s that have moderate degrees of this behavior, you can take that same child and they can find something that they're highly engaged in and attentive to, and they can stay focused for hours. Maybe it's their video games, maybe it's online with social, or maybe it's a particular topic or a sport or something. And when they're engaged in that, a lot of these symptoms aren't there. I'm always amazed at how the teachers and the counselors and psychologists or psychiatrists or whatever um, want to quickly put a label on children, but they don't look at them 24 hours a day and find out where they're dis highly engaged. Whenever there's an attention deficit, there is an attention surplus. And I haven't yet to see one that didn't have it, but locating what they have attention surplus in, highly focused, attentive, non-distracted states, in my opinion, is a crucial component to know how to manage this, this so-called condition. So in order to appreciate what I'm gonna share on this, I, I have to develop something that I do in almost every presentation I do. It's it's a discussion on human values. So if you have something to write with and write on, you might want to just put these two together because this is crucial. And this I rarely see in any literature, and I don't know why it's so obvious, but I just want to share it with you because it's I know it's fact. I know it's something that's solid. So every human being lives by a set of priorities, a set of values, things that are most important to least important. Every individual regardless of culture, regardless of age, gender, et cetera. So if you look carefully, there are some things that you are highly inspired by, engaged in, focused on, and you can do spontaneously. And there's other things that you don't want to do. A young boy, for instance, may love his video games. He can sit there for hours focused on video games, not distracted, not hyperactive, but calm and centered and, and beating the game. And then they may have something that's uninspiring to them, like taking the trash out or doing chores or cleaning their room or maybe some boring homework. And now they're fidgety and they have immediate gratification and they don't want to deal with it and they get distracted easily. Most people have seen that. It's not hard to see. Look in your own life. When I'm getting to research on something to do with human behavior, I can engage all day long. But if all of a sudden you start talking about cars or cooking or something that's low on my values, I get easily distracted or bored or whatever. So whatever's highest on your value, you are spontaneously inspired and focused and disciplined and reliable to be putting energy into it and to be focused on it. And you're attentive there. And the way the brain is set up, 
you have a tension surplus order there, retention surplus, that means you retain the information, and intention surplus, that means you intend to do it. You'd stay disciplined, focused on it. But whatever's low on your value, you are procrastinative, hesitative, and frustrated by, and you are attention deficit, intention deficit, and retention deficit. That means you don't really pay attention to it, you won't retain it, and you don't want to apply and put energy into it. So whenever activities are disengaging, uninspiring, unfulfilling to a child, they're going to be bored doing it, or they're going to be burned out if you force them to do it. Now, what's interesting is one of the treatments that psychiatry, the medical model that plays with ADHD, is they gave them stimulants or non-stimulants. In other words, if one doesn't work, they give them the other one. Because if they're bored, stimulants helps them because it's an artificial neuro, a neurotransmitter stimulation, usually norepinephrine and dopamine related, that lift them up, makes them think that they're engaged. And if it's they're in a sense, they're hyperactive and they're on the other side of the equation and they're burned out forcing to do it, they may do the opposite because they get irritated and get aggressive and sometimes frustrated by it. So they take them and sedate them. So the medication is sort of a, not a real absolute science and guarantee. It's kind of a hit and miss to some degree. And when you are in a situation where you don't have the time to do what I'm about to share with you and you feel overwhelmed and the teachers don't want to take the time so what happens is they stick them on medication. And uh, back around 2012 or 13, when they changed the ICD-9 codes for diagnosis, there's a movie you might want to go take a peek at called The Million Dollar Deal. They found out that there was a, the head of the neuro, uh, the psychiatry association um, and the pharmaceutical industries got in cahoots and changed the, the description of the conditions in such a way that almost every child from about age eight would be able to be on a medication. So they automatically, now you almost can't go to school without, if there's any slight hesitation <clears throat> or slight activation of this hyperactivity that they just stick them on medication. And there is side effects and it's wise as a parent uh, to read about all the side effects of the drugs long-term because there is side effects. You can't take a drug without a side effect. The PDR, physician's desk reference shows this and I'm not saying it doesn't have a place. And it doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with those side effects. <clears throat> but, you know, parents that don't want to learn what I'm about to show with you, they're, they're probably going to do that. But just know that there's, you're, 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 you're labeling a child, you're getting them focused, you're not teaching them about how their physiology works, and you're not giving them feedback. And there's possibly not even a condition here. It may just be a focus, and I'm going to show you what to do with it. But just know that if you, if you do that, that's the reason why they're putting them on stimulants or non-stimulants based on uh, boredom or burnout. Burnout is when you feel like you're having to go to school and somebody's forcing you to do something and your teachers and parents are forcing you to do something you don't really want to do and you're burned out because you're constantly under a sympathetic response inside your brain going, this is a, a fight or flight response and you want to run around and get away from it and escape and you got all this energy that's burnt up. It's like an adrenaline uh, stimulus. And so that's, that's uh, where this, the sedative or stimulative approaches are. Now, let's, let's take a look at this. You have inside your brain a forebrain, which is called the medial prefrontal cortex, which is the executive center, which governs behavior, which calms down and inhibits hyperactivity and immediate gratification. <clears throat> it calms down impulsivity. It calms down instinctual fears. So that means instead of something that you don't want to do that's accentuated, you calm down and you're less resistant to it. And it's not so much impulsive. So you calm down impulse and you calm down resistance. That in itself will help. So anything you can do to get the child into the executive center is going to help reduce the symptoms automatically. And then you also have a, you might say the amygdala or the kind of the animal desire center, which is that there and down into the, the hindbrain. And this is where impulses and instincts occur. This is where you desire pleasure and avoid pain. So if a child is disengaged and uninspired and doesn't have something that it's doing that's really meaningful to it, the amygdala comes online, gets blood and glucose and get oxygen there, and it goes into activity and it wants to avoid activities that it's not inspired by and quickly go and do immediate gratification. Whenever you're in your amygdala, the time and space horizon shrink. 
So that means your attention gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And whenever you're in the executive function, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more patient. And because at the executive center calms down impulses and instincts, you become more resilient and adaptable in almost anything you can see on the way, not in the way. But if you're down in your amygdala, anything that reminds you of something you don't want to do gets accentuated. Anything you do want to do gets heightened. But because of hedonic adaptation in the brain, which is basically a calming down, just like when you go out on a date and the first night you kiss for 45 minutes um, and the second night, 43, and the next night, 41, and you kiss a little bit less each time, that's hedonic adaptation and it desensitizes it, you might say, or, or, or adapts to this pleasure seeking. And this is what the child does. So what happens is it goes into this impulsivity and it quickly then calms it down and goes on to the next thing. So what I'm saying here is that if we get the child to find out what it loves doing, what it's inspired by, what it spontaneously does, I guarantee you, so far in all the cases I've worked with, when I work with children, there's something that the child does that they're absolutely focused on or more heightenedly focused on, and they can spend hours on it without distraction. Finding out what that is and finding out what the common denominator of those activities, if it's more than one is, and identifying what is highest on your child's values. You know, almost every seminar I talk about, I talk about values, as I said, and on my website, I have a complimentary uh, value determination process. It's free, complimentary. It's about 30 minutes of your time. It's 13 basic questions to narrow down what your life demonstrates is valuable and important to you. I cannot emphasize, find out close attention to what your child is spontaneously inspired by and stays focused on. It may be video games and you may sit there, well, stop that video game. When you've done your homework, you can do the video game. And what you're doing is you, instead of identifying what is really meaningful and inspiring to the child, you keep pushing on the things that it has no engagement in. And that adds to the problem. First, find out what is highest on their value, where they are spontaneously centered and focused and patient and attentive to. Because they are, the, every child has a place. I mean, I, I, I've had parents come to me and say, well, there's nothing, there, there's nothing. And I asked, I can't think of anything that they're focused on. They're just running around and everything else. I said, stop. Find out what it is and look at when he's calm and centered. And they finally go, oh yeah, well, when he's doing video games, yeah. Or when he's playing soccer or when he's working on his, on his uh, toy engine that he's building. Okay, finding out what that highest value is, what's totally engaging. And then we now wanna make links to other topics, other actions and other items in their life to that. Because once the child sees what's important to the child and sees everything else related to that and connected to that by linking, the child stays engaged. Anytime you can get the child to live in what its highest values are, you will find that the behavior automatically calms down. It automatically becomes more centered and attentive, less distracted, less hyperactive. So find out what that is. That's the first thing. Go on my website, learn how to determine values, pay close attention to the 13 questions that it asks you. Now look at your child or your teenager, maybe your husband or wife who has this, and go and look at where they are focused. And don't say they aren't. And if they say that they're not, look again, because it's there. Once you find out what that is and you realize that they have a selective attention, a selective concentrated attention that doesn't happen to match what everybody else is expecting them to go and learn and do. Once you find that, you've got the core. Now, anytime a child can live by priority and do what's really engaging to them, you can see the change in their behavior right off the bat. Because if they can sit there for hours on video games, then they obviously see something in the video game that's meaningful to them. And instead of suppressing that and going wrong, um, if you can link other things to that, I'm going to show you and give an example in a minute, then you will get the, that you will broaden it. And the broader you make it, the more they come back into a, a function where they can actually work without having some of these symptoms. But first identify what that is, because in their highest values, that's where they're focused. That's where they're disciplined. That's where they're reliable. That's where they're organized. That's where they're ordered. That's where they can stay engaged. 
That's where their creative genius is. That's where they expand their space and time horizons and have patience. That's where they're inspired. That's when they're present. That's when they're more objective, more reasonable, less narcissistically demanding and interruptive. They're, they're actually more in a state of equanimity and equity in that state when you find out what that is. So that's the first step. The second step is to start to prioritize their life so they can have the time to focus on that which is priority to them. Now you're first thinking, but that's not right. I got to get him to school and I got to do this and he's got to do that. Well, do you love doing got to's and have to's that the world imposes on you? Or do you love doing something that inspires you? My son loved video games too, but today he's a video YouTuber. He's got 31,000 people that are paying attention to him. And that's his business and career path. That's what he's doing. And there's some of his mentors are making 50 million, $25 million a year doing it. So don't negate that and rule that out because that's part of the future. And we have to face that. We can't live in the past. We've got to realize what's going on today in careers and possibilities for jobs. Now, <clears throat> once you identify what this is, now you make links to that. And so I'm going to give you a story here <clears throat> and give you an example. I was 25 years old. I was in clinical uh, internship at uh, my, my college that I was going to school. And uh, I had a boy who had this attention deficit hyperactivity. And the mother brought him in. As occasionally I saw the father, but most of the time the mother. And this kid literally would run back and forth in a small room, an eight by 10 room, run back and forth in it. And uh, like climbing the walls, running around the table, crawling under the table, coming up and making faces at me and running off and stuff like that. The typical kind of bizarre states. So I asked the mom, I said, so go to a moment where and when your son has been calm, centered, focused, and not distracted. And at first she said, I have no idea. He's just running around and everything else until he crashes at night. And then he's out. Okay, let's look again. And she finally looked and scanned. And then she goes, okay, my boy loves trains. He loves trains. Yeah. And anything to do with trains, he can, he'll, he'll read about or he'll focus on. Well, that's interesting. So um, I, I brought the kid over to him. I, I started walking to him and he came up to me. And I said, so your mom says you love trains. He said, yep. And he started, he kept doing it. I said, what's the longest train you've ever seen? How many cars does it have? And all of a sudden he stopped and he thought, I don't know, more than a hundred. How many cars were tank cars versus, you know, carrying cars, box cars? He goes, Hmm. And how many of them actually were carrying cars on cars? And I made him think because he loved trains. I said, where's the last time you watched a long train? Was it a freight train or passenger train? I started engaging him and he sat and he started talking to me. And as long as I asked him questions about what was important to him, trains, then I asked him, where do those trains get all the stuff that they carry? And I, he says, hmm, don't know. I said, well, they sometimes ship into a port. They port loads them onto a train, the boxcars, and then they take them to locations in different cities to different routes. How wide is the track? Have you measured it? How many wheels on the car? What most common color you see in those cars? How many engines per how many cars can it carry? Is the engine going backwards or forward? <clears throat> when is the train, what's the average speed when it crosses? I just started asking questions and made it think. And all the, the, the child all of a sudden was thinking and engaging and quiet and focused. And the mother's like going, whoa, this is interesting. And as long as I kept him focused on cars, on trains, on anything to do with the train, I had his attention. And she sat there and she goes, I can't believe I've never, I've never really paid attention to this. I just occasionally he gets focused on cars and he can do it. I said, does he have models of, of trains? He goes, yes. And does he put them together? Yes. And does he stay focused when he does it? More than usual? Yes. He'll do it for an hour and two and then he'll stop. Okay, well that's two hours of focused attention. That's pretty good. That's pretty good for his age. 
because he's doing something that's meaningful to him. Does he have magazines that are trained? He goes, no. Should I get him some? I said, yes. Have you taken him? You, you live here in Pasadena. There's the, the ship channel here. Out of the ship channels, all the train routes going out. Why don't you take him down there and let him go and study trains? And then see if you can't get him a book and go to a bookstore and find a book. This, these days there were bookstores. It wasn't Amazon. <laughs> And I said, why don't you go and see about uh, getting him a book on trains and let him see if he can read and engage him. See, anything that you can associate with what the child is very inspired by, you will expand the child's awareness and associations in the brain. He has a concentrated, highly concentrated attention surplus order. As a result of it, he has incredible order in that area and attention deficit to everything else unrelated to the topic. But if you start to link things to that topic, it expands. And then if you make connections, by the way, how many people actually are in passenger trains? What's the length? How many people sit in a car? Are there sleeping cars? Let's go find out. Let's go on the internet. Let's go on the, on the, the dictionary. Let's go find out. Let's go explore and get him engaged. And the more you keep adding to this thing called trains and correlate, then go, well, what's the average train cost? What's the average train ride if you if you ride on a passenger ticket? And what's the type of cars that were there? And what type of social structure does it take to have the income to do that? And how much money? As long as you keep weaving things back to trains, he'll keep getting engaged and stay, stay focused. And the moment you do that, I, I, I learned from Marilyn Wilhelm, who was an amazing teacher, who had the Wilhelm School for, for Children, how she would identify what was most important to the child and keep allowing the child to excel by teaching everybody else that topic. And then whenever somebody else wanted to do singing or whatever, then she would teach about singing and when somebody won football and he would teach about football and everybody got to teach and engage in what they were inspired by. And then everybody in the room was then engaging in cross-referencing. So she said, well, what was the type of train uh, in 1954? Good, who is the number one singer? Who is the baseball star at the time? And everybody in the school, the classes got engaged according to their needs, but yet they were getting cross-reference between their needs and everybody else's needs and expanding their knowledge. This is possible to do with attention deficit. Now, the second you get this boy engaged in what was important, the trains, he became a friend. He wasn't interruptive. He wasn't running. He was curious. He asked his mom, can we get that magazine or get that book? Can we go down to the ship channel, mom? Can we go watch trains? And he would then report back to me on the next visit, three days later, two days later, what he learned. So now he's engaged and wants to talk to me because I'm associated with what's valuable to him, trains. Because I've now got him in his executive center, focused. And the second he's in his executive center, his space and time horizons get bigger. He doesn't get hyperactive. He's not impulsive. He's not dominating and domineering because that's trying to get attention saying, I want what I want. I want to be able to do something that's meaningful to me. Every human being wants to learn. They want to learn what's valuable to them. And sometimes people have concentrated, highly associative areas that are like trains. The more I connected things to train, the more this child became engaged. Now, I only worked in the clinic there for a couple of years. I only got to watch the boy for a couple of years, but we were able to link classes to his, his uh, t trains. He was able to go and build trains. He was able to go and visit trains. He got to talk to engineers. He got to talk to people that were involved in trains. He got to go to the ticket counter at trains. He got to learn about money. He got to learn about, he was learning anything to do with trains. He became the most knowledgeable kid on trains. That gave him a center of attention the teacher quit labeling him, stopped the label and started to learn what I was trying to share, that the child has an attention surplus order, a highly focused attention. And if you expand it, they'll grow. Somewhere in his life, probably there was a choo-choo train or something like that that was highly pleasurable and some other things around him were painful and he got associated with the pleasures of, of a train and he concentrated his focus there to deal with the other stuff. So here's what I want you to get. I want you to get that before you label the child, before you medicate the child, please try to find out what they are attentive to most. Find out what their highest value is. There was one lady that found out her boy wanted to draw 
stars on windows. He would draw stars on, on the walls. He would draw stars on furniture. He would draw, he was, everything was stars. She finally figured out, obviously he's into stars. So she bought him a book on a stars for astronomy for kids. And he started devouring it. Eventually he was doing and drawing anything to do with stars. He was drawing uh, solar systems and he was learning about it. Well, this kid became uh, at the Perimeter Institute by the time he was a teenager, he got a PhD in astrophysics. And the kid that they thought was gonna be non-functional in school turned out to be way ahead of everybody else. So my point is find out what it is that they are inspired, engaged, focused, disciplined, reliable, not distracted from, because what they're doing when they're getting it surrounded by stuff that's not inspiring to them, they're looking for something that is. And the second they can find it, they can pinpoint. So the train was this boy's, but I've seen different things. I saw horses with another girl one time, and I saw soccer with another boy one time, and finding out what it is. And I've seen social media with some people at times, or I see certain types of games that they get in social media that's engaging at times. Sometimes they want you to actually believe it. The parents are actually anti-guns and anti-violence and everything else. And they concentrate on, on video games that are in violence to counterbalance the family. And the parents say, no, you can't do that. And they got hyperactive kid and they don't realize that that's exactly what he's interested in. Guns, shooting. And you say, well, you can't do that, it's bad. No, it's not necessarily. He might end up being a general someday and one of the leaders of our country. You don't know. So don't make it evil. Every single value system out there has a place on the planet. Every value system. And when it doesn't match your value system, you label it wrong and, 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 and uh, cruel or negative or evil or whatever out of ignorance. The whole world depends on the full spectrum of value systems. And we sometimes have conformity to the conformant average instead of finding out the uniqueness. And sometimes the very unique people are the leaders in the future. And so that doesn't mean that I had a little bit of the tension deficit too when I was a child. I had learning problems as a child. I used to go and drum my fingers and move around and stuff like that. I'm a scholar today. So I found out what inspired me, the evolution of human consciousness, human behavior, maximizing human awareness of potential. And now I've excelled in that. I can stay hours and hours and hours and hours in that. But you get me in front of a cooking class or a car show and I'm gonna have ADHD. <laughs> Attention deficit. Now, here's uh, some action steps to take. Besides finding out what that is, identifying what the values are, paying close attention, not negating it, find out what the highest values are, number one. Find out how that serves everybody in the family. Have the teacher find out how that value serves the teacher. If the teacher negates that value, she'll talk down and suppress the child autocratically. Find out how that, whatever that is, how it helps the teacher, because the teacher deserves to respect the child's values instead of impose on it. And you do the same. And find out how it helps everybody in the family, because when they're concentrated, it's dispersed, it's, it's counterbalancing a dispersion of family dynamics, I promise you. Something that's unimportant gets concentrated in importance in the child within a family dynamic. Pay close attention to that. Then what you do is then Give the child the opportunity to do what it's doing and let it excel in that and keep expanding it. Keep adding things that relate to it and keep linking it by asking questions. The greatest way to link things is asking questions. So if there's, how, how what's the longest train? Let's go find the longest train. How many cars is it? How many engines does it take? Now, how much energy does it take to do that? Let's go and find out how, what's the fuel for the engine? How's the engine manufactured? As long as we're relating to trains, it's going to keep wanting to know more about things. What's the, how is the, what's it made out of? What is it made out of metal? How's the metal made? What's the fuel? Is it coal? Is it wood? Is it uh, diesel? What's it made out of? And who owns the companies and how many companies are there in the world? And who's the wealthiest people in the world? And they may go, whoa, I want to be wealthy and be a, a, an engineer and own a train company. As long as you keep linking new things in all areas of life to that, how many people can it carry? What does that do to society? How many, how many jobs does that give? How many people are able to have that? How many people meet on a train? How many ever have babies and families as a result of it? Just keep relating everything to a train and you will engage your child and expand their awareness and blow your mind. And I've seen this over and over again. 
So find out what their values are, let them concentrate on it, keep adding things to it, keep linking relationships of other things that you may want them to learn to it, make the connections, honor their values, find out how their values serve you, allow them to do it. Because the moment you get them in their highest values, their space and time horizons go and they'll be more patient. You'll see the patients grow as they do. If not, shorten the time down to get the expectations down into reasonable time frames when you expect things from them. But when you actually get them engaged, it will expand and allow them to excel. Let them be the center of attention around that topic. Keep asking more questions about the topic that they're inspired by so they gain confidence skills, gain leadership skills on themselves. Let, let them emerge as a leader. When they do, they're more likely to want to tackle challenges that inspire them and prepare themselves to wake up their natural leader. You're training and myelinating the executive center, not the amygdala. That's the problem with the ADHD. You amygdala is, is alive, but the executive center is shut down. It's not myelinated. And so you got a running wild animal around the house. But once you get them engaged in something inspiring, the amygdala calms down and you start having less impulse and instinct because instinct is a subjective bias about against pain and impulse is a subjective bias towards pleasure. And that's basically avoid this, seek this. And they're con then when they, get, when they get adapted to the thing that they seek, they go to the next thing because their time horizons are so small because they're disengaged in what's around them. But give them something they're engaged on and you can see the impact immediately. All the people in the family that's been disrupted from it because they didn't know how to manage it, have them come and do the Demartini method. Like I teach it in the Breakthrough Experience. The Breakthrough Experience, I give you the Demartini method, which is a tool on how to dissolve emotional baggage you've associated with people and how to love and appreciate them for who they are and have to have reflective awareness. If everybody in the family appreciates and honors the child's for its unique value structure and sees how it serves them and doesn't judge them and put them down and become autocrats and try to control the child, the child will come out and bloom. The child will excel and you'll get to watch the genius unfold. And that's really what uh, this ADHD. So be organized, give them a routine, give them the ability to focus on what's inspiring to them. Don't dishonor it. Don't punish them if they're doing it and reward them if they're doing only what you're wanting them to do because you're training them how to be a drone instead of an independent thinker that stands out. You might find that this person that's hyperactive might end up being the next Elon Musk in the first thing, doing something that's something that's unprecedented in the world. So, so th these, these conditions, as they call them, these disorders that, that people blow out of their butt uh, as a diagnosis title, are sometimes nothing more than a feedback mechanism. The symptoms are a feedback mechanism to help children be authentic, to go and pursue what's meaningful to them. And living in a society that doesn't want you to stand out, it wants you to fit in, that's not difficult. That's it's difficult for these children. So give them an opportunity to be themselves and let them go and excel in what they do. I've seen this, like I say, in many different areas that the children is and finding that out is a day your life changes and their life changes. And teach your child and teach the parents about these two aspects, the amygdala and the executive center. Put it in your own words, that the way they understand it. Let them understand that they're unique and don't put a label on them. Because the second you put a label on them and diagnose them, and put it in Latin and put them on a medication and put them into side effects and ignore what's important to them, you may have just missed out on a genius in your hands that's really capable of doing something extraordinary. So I just wanted to take a few moments to to share something on that in case that happens to be something you're relating to in your family or extended family or friends. But attention deficit disorder is also got it counterbalanced by an attention surplus order. Find out where the attention is surplused and where there's a tremendous amount of order and organization in the child and let them excel and keep expanding that. If you keep expanding that, you will be able to take and link anything. The, the way the brain is set up, anything can be linked to anything. If I asked you if you're interested in trains and I asked you how many people they carried and what percentage of the population, I can now relate that to sociology. If I said, what's the engine uh, burning as fuel? And I can now take it to chemistry. If I go in and said, and how fast is it going? I can take it to physics. If I can say, what's the sound and what's the, the actual frequency of the sound? I can take it to music. I can take the train and link it to anything else and start engaging them in other things by asking them questions that make a link. So all of a sudden expand this 
this view because anything that's related to what's important to them, they can expand into. And all of a sudden, once you've got them associated and expanded, instead of this concentrated focus, it's now broader. And now they're able to function pretty well in society, you know, without fully aware of what they're doing, knowing what they're doing and knowing how to use that, training them on how to use that talent. So if they're around a situation that they seems and boring, they can know how to ask questions. How can I link it? And then they can be engaged. And the same thing for people. Every one of us have had moments in our life where we've met people that we were going boring, disengaging. They said their name and you forgot their name in a billionth of a second. And somebody asked you, who was that? And you go, I don't know. Well, they just said their name. I said, yeah, I didn't get it because you were not even focused on it. But if somebody that's really valuable comes up to you and says their name, you remember it, you recite it, you repeat it, you write it down, you'll engaged in it. So this is going on with all of us. We all have varying degrees of this in different moments on different topics based on our own values. So know what the values are of your child. Learn to communicate in those values. Give them an opportunity to excel in those values. Find out how those values serve you so you don't have to fix them. You can appreciate them because when you love and appreciate from who they are, they turn into who you love. It opens the doorways for a new type of relationship with your child or your, your spouse or whoever this is at whatever age it is. Because these are labels and they're diagnosis. Dia, diagnosis means through knowledge, supposedly, but it could also mean dia, die agnosis to who don't know, you and they. So be aware of the labels. We sometimes do that because we are caught in a model, a pharmaceutical model that we're just immediately think, well, a solution is a drug. And that's not always the case. The greatest pharmaceutical industry there is, is your brain. There's no pharmaceutical on this planet, no pharmaceutical company on this planet, no pharmaceutical specialist on the planet that can know more than your own brain. At this stage, it's not possible. So learn how to use the brain and give your child his brain back. That's my experience. So I'm not saying there's just not a time for the medications for people that aren't willing to do what I just said, or people who don't know how to do it, or people that are too preoccupied with their, their curriculum and their things and not really the kids, which is the purpose of the education. Well, then they're gonna stick them on that. And thank God it's there, but that's not the first uh, approach, first solution. First solution is to try to engage the child in his genius awakening. Okay. I think I've said uh, something on ADHD now. Hopefully that was helpful in case you know somebody that has it, this so-called condition. Uh, it may be nothing but a feedback mechanism to guide the child to be authentic and the parents to learn how to communicate and society to learn how to communicate. Now, to help on this process, to help the child expand itself, here's something for you, the parent or the child, and then both of you can watch this. It's called awakening your astronomical vision because the greater the vision, the greater your life. That's why if you can expand your child's vision and get them from the highly concentrated value system and expand it, you're going to change their life and you're going to change your life and the family. So I have an Awaken Your Astronomical Vision. It's a live presentation I did at a planetarium to uh, executives and people running big companies, but it's about people with a vision flourish and those without a vision perish. And whether it's a child or whether it's a young adult, anybody can benefit from this, this uh, package. This is a complimentary package I want to give you. It's valued at $50. All you got to do is go to demartini.fm slash gift and grab it. You'll watch it. Watch it multiple times. Uh, once you've seen it, then let your child see bits and pieces of it or the whole thing if they're engaged. But please take advantage of the information. Go on my website. Help determine the values. You, what you can learn on there, you can observe in your child and determine what their values are and what's really important. A child has something very important to their life. Help them excel at that, and they'll find meaning and purpose, and they'll excel. Okay, so thank you for joining me today on ADHD. I look forward to our next uh, presentation coming up in the following week. And um, please, if you got a value out of this presentation and you know somebody can value, please help me get this out. Let them know about my YouTube, my podcast. Let them know about the website, because we are an educational institution. We're dedicated to educating people on things that can help them maximize their life. So please take advantage and let people know. Just send the links out, tell people about it. I appreciate that because when I'm speaking here, this message, in my opinion, this message needs to be heard. There's a lot out there that people are getting that's misinformation, as you know, and this is something that will be helpful to them. There's nothing to lose by learning how to identify their values and help them appreciate your child and engage and communicate and help them in the linking process. I've seen it work wonders. I've watched it impact families. 
please take advantage of the information and share that with people you care about. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining me.